Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and presenting tonight two of radio's foremost personalities, Everett Sloan and Kermit Murdoch, in Survival of the Fittest. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as we hear a strange story of hate and intrigue. I call it Survival of the Fittest. <laughs> But first, a short message from the Ford dealers of America. Over 120,000 delighted motorists are already driving the new 50 Ford. Here's what Mrs. Emily E. Curry, a welfare worker, said about her 50 Ford. As a welfare worker, I'm constantly on the go. And I must have a car that's dependable. But being a woman, naturally, I want a pretty car, too. I looked at all the cars and selected Ford because it gives me most of what I want. It's dependable, economical, and a real beauty both inside and outside. I've owned several makes of cars, but none that I like so well as my new 50 Ford. We Ford dealers are not surprised that new owners rave about their 50 Fords. We know every detail of its 50 ways new for 50. But you won't be able to believe how good it is until you test drive the 50 Ford. The classified phone directory will give you the name of the nearest Ford dealer, or perhaps you know him personally. Why don't you phone him tomorrow? Before you buy any car at any price, test drive the 50 Ford. Our story begins near the outskirts of a small New England town. It is early evening. Situated on a high hill that overlooks the town is a large and ancient mansion, the ancestral home of five generations of DeWitt. A car turns off the highway and into the private road. Slowly it crawls along the winding and bumpy driveway, its headlights illuminating the crumbling, ghostly-looking mansion. At last the car comes to a stop. An elderly man gets out and walks up the wide stone steps to the front door. He looks about uneasily, then lifts the huge knocker on the door. Skyler, open up. Let me in. Skyler, open up. Yeah, who's down there? You know, it's Paul Adams. I must see you. Go away, you old vulture. I don't want to see you. Oh, Skyler, I'm your lawyer, and I demand that you let me in. No one sets foot in this house. No one, do you hear? That includes you. I've got to talk to you. Now, you've got a great many legal matters to discuss. Now, just leave those legal papers on the front steps and get off my property. I'll look them over in my own good time, just like I've always you, done. But, Skyler, now, how, how can I... Don't argue, you old vulture. Just do as I say. All right, Skyler. I'm leaving the briefcase by the front door. I'll look everything over. I'll be back tomorrow night to pick it up. I thought you'd see it my way. Now get off my property. You're trespassing. Oh, good evening, Paul. Come in. Thank you, Alex. Come into my study. What brings you here at this hour? Alex, I've just been out to the DeWitt mansion to see Skylar. Oh? Now have a seat. Thank you. And what did you go out to see Skylar about? The legal matters? Uh, what else? Alex, that man's getting more and more difficult to deal with. Do you realize that in the 20 years I've been his lawyer, he's never allowed me into that house? Well, I hardly know what he looks like. I'm afraid very few people do. Alex... You're his doctor, the one person he permits inside that mansion. You've got to do something. What do you suggest? Uh, he's getting worse all the time. It's unbelievable, a man with all that money cutting himself off from life. And all on account of a woman. You never knew Skyler's wife, did you? No. Uh, was she as beautiful as they say? Words can't describe Christine's beauty. She was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And the cleverest as well. It sounds to me, Doctor, as though you'd been in love with her yourself. I was. 
I'll never forget the day that Christine ran off to Paris with Gordon DeWitt, Skyler's brother. When Skyler found her note, he was like a madman. Mm, too bad. But the, both Christine and Gordon DeWitt are dead. They're killed in that air raid in London during the war. Now, Skyler knows that. It's time he stopped thinking of her. Not Skyler. He'll go on living in that huge mansion with his memories until the day he dies. You'd think he'd go insane there alone without anyone to talk to. He isn't quite alone. He has three cats for company. Mm, cats? You call that company? What, what does he do with himself? Well, for one thing, he reads a great deal. Yes. At this moment, he's probably sitting in his study, reading by oil light. There are books piled all over the place, with hardly space to walk. Mm. And the cats are in the study with him. Mm. You know, I suspect that when Skyler is alone, he speaks to them, treats them as if they were human, could understand them. This book, Socrates, was written by a fool. <laughs> Sheer nonsense, every word of it. Don't know why I wasted so much time on it. Well, enough of it. It's well after midnight, and we... Oh, what infernal fool is at our door at this hour? It couldn't be Dr. Stevens. He's got more sense. Must be that lawyer of mine, Paul Adams, come back again. Don't know why I put up with that man. Hey, who's down there? Come down and open the door, Skylar. I want to see you. Go away, whoever you are. Don't you recognize my voice? Uh, who is it? It's your brother. My brother? What do you take me for, a fool? Get off my property. Come down and open the door, Skylar. It's Gordon. His voice, but it couldn't be. It couldn't be. You hear me, Skylar? No, you can't be Gordon. Gordon was killed in an air raid during the war. He's been dead five years. So everyone believes. I have a cigarette lighter here. I'll light it and hold it up to my face. There. Gordon. It is Gordon. Satisfied? Now let me in. So you're alive, huh? And you've come back. This is the last place in the world you should have returned to, Gordon. Perhaps. You coming down let me in? Yes, Gordon. I'm coming down. Ah, come in, Gordon. You've changed, Skylar. Considerably. Yes, Gordon. I've changed considerably. It's been 20 years. They said you'd been killed in an air raid during the war. I walked out of a London theater two minutes before it was demolished by a bomb. It was assumed I'd been killed with hundreds of others. And Christine? She died in the theater. Poor Christine. <laughs> Poor Christine, indeed. You dare laugh at her memory. It's time, Skylar, you learn the truth about Christine. I forbid you to speak about her, Gordon. Not a word. You're going to listen whether you like it or not. Sit down. I'll kill you, Gordon. I... Sit where you are. That's better. From the moment you met Christine 25 years ago, you behaved like a fool. You saw Christine not as she was, but as someone to be placed on a pedestal, worshipped. She was never the woman you dreamed of. Christine was like the rest of us, with all our faults and weaknesses. Everything you're saying is a lie, a lie! If she hadn't run off with me, she'd have run off with any one of half a dozen other men who were in love with her. Not a word you're saying is true, not a word! You turned her head with your lies and promises. You robbed me of her love, lured her away. Only an idiot would believe that. Christine ran off with me because she wanted to. She was a woman with desires and a mind of her own. I don't believe a word of it. Not a word. You're saying all this for a purpose. What do you want? Why have you come here? What I've told you is true. My purpose in coming here? Very simple. Money. I chose to allow everyone to believe I had died in that London theater because I was heavily in debt. Since that time, I've been living in France under an assumed identity. And you finally come here for financial assistance, eh? Yes, Skylar, I have. I know that you're worth millions. You can well afford to give me a small part of it. A bit ironic, don't you think? You run off with a man's wife, and 20 years later, you ask him to assist you? I tell you, you were well rid of Christine. The woman you loved didn't exist. And for revealing this great truth to me after 20 years, you expect money, hmm? I'm still your brother. 
You can't let me starve. No, of course I won't let you starve, Gordon. As you say, you are my brother. Then you will give me some money. Money? No. But you are perfectly free to live here with me, Gordon. I've plenty of empty rooms. Forty, to be exact. You find here food and shelter. And brotherly love, of course. It wasn't my idea to live here. I'm sorry, Gordon, but that's all I can offer you. I see. Thank you, Skylar. Leaving already? Goodbye, Skylar. <laughs> Goodbye, Gordon. <laughs> yes, Socrates. He'll be back. He'll be back. <laughs> Someone at the front door. <laughs> Must be Gordon. I knew he'd be back. Held out a week, but in the end, he came back. Yeah, who is it? Dr. Stevens. Oh, you, doctor. Come down and open the door, Skyler. It's been six months since you've let me in. It's time you had a checkup. Go away, doctor. I'm feeling fine. Oh, are you now? Why is your voice so hoarse? I've had a light cold for a couple of weeks, that's all. I don't need any doctor. Now, go away. Well, let me in anyway. We can talk, can't we? We've got nothing to talk about, doctor. You live in one world, I live in another. And what of Christine, Skyler? We both knew her and loved her. Yes, we, we both knew her, but I was the only one she loved. Everything he said was a pack of lies, nothing but lies. What's that? Skyler, let me in. I can't hear you from here. Huh? All right. I'm coming down. Have a seat, Doctor. Thank you, Skyler. You have the oil wick down so low there's hardly any light. Light mm. isn't necessary for talk, Doctor. No, I suppose it isn't. How have you been feeling, Skyler? Do you have any chest pains? Sounds like a heavy cold to me. I told you I'm all right. Have you had any callers lately? Callers? I mean, has anyone shown up you haven't seen in years? Why, no. Why do you ask? I, I was just wondering. Gordon is back. Gordon is back? Yes. What are you talking about, Skyler? Gordon is dead. No, he's alive. But you don't know what you're saying, Scott. He was killed in a London air raid during the war. No, you're wrong. Gordon walked out of that theater two minutes before it was bombed, leaving Christine behind. He told me so himself. Told you so himself? Yes, he showed up here a week ago, the same Gordon. Twenty years older, a bit down at the heel, but as debonair as ever. And as skillful a liar, I might add. But he's dead, I tell you. Yes, that's what I thought, but he isn't. Trust Gordon to come out of an air raid alive. Skylar, get a hold of yourself. You imagined it all. Imagined it all? Yes, you didn't see Gordon. It was all in hallucination. Uh, hallucination? What What are you trying to say? That, I, that I'm going mad? I, I tell you, he was here a week ago, sat in the same chair you're sitting in. How could he, Skylar, when he's dead? But he isn't. Skylar, listen. I was stationed in London during the war knew the medical officers whose job it was to treat the air raid wounded and identify the dead. But what are you getting at? I spoke to the officer who identified Gordon and Christine. What? Yes. Both were horribly mutilated, of course. But Gordon was identified by his name bracelet, his ring and watch. No. No, that couldn't be. It's true. I myself saw the bracelet, ring and watch. I recognized the ring. It was the one Gordon got on his 21st birthday. Gordon dead? Yes. But, but I, I saw him. I swear to it. Of course you would, Skyler. Hallucinations are like that. So vivid, so lifelike that, that you would swear to them. Now listen to me, Skyler. You know I'm your friend. Have been since we were children. I want you to listen to me very carefully. Good night, Skyler. Just leave everything to me. It shouldn't take longer than two weeks. 
All right, Doctor. Everything's going to be all right. There's nothing to worry about. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Good evening, Carla. Wait. Hey, Gordon! That was Alex Stevens, wasn't it? I decided to wait till he left. You're dead. You're dead. What are you talking about? You must be. You've gone out of your mind? Here. Feel my hand. Is that a dead man's hand? But Dr. Stevens said your body had been identified. That, that he himself had seen your bracelet ring. Watch. So you told him I'd call on you, hmm? He said I... I'd had a hallucination. Hallucination? I'm afraid not. But the body that was identified, the bracelet, ring, and watch. Very simple. I ran back to the theater after the explosion to see if Christine was still alive. It was then it occurred to me how convenient it would be to have myself thought dead. I found a badly mangled body, removed the identification, and substituted my own. And they thought it was you? Yes. Shall we go in the house? By all means, Gordon. By all means. Well, I gather that you've decided to take advantage of my generous offer. Yes, Kyler, I haven't any choice. I'm stone broke. I see. Uh, have a seat, Gordon. Thank you. <laughs> what the devil's so funny? <laughs> oh, clever, clever, Gordon. You think I don't know what you've come back for, eh, Gordon? What are you talking about? As you well recall, Gordon, Mother left me the income from a half-million-dollar trust fund. When I die, that trust fund will go to charity. However, if you should turn up after my death, the income would go to you, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. 40000 a year, that's a tidy sum. Have you decided how you're going to do it, Gordon? What's it to be, a gun, poison, a blunt instrument? I haven't quite made up my mind, Skylar. Aren't you a little frightened? Why should I be? You're going to find me a very difficult problem, Gordon. Unless I die a natural death, you'll be open to suspicion when you appear to claim the income from the trust fund. I'm aware of that, Skylar. Yes, indeed, I'm going to be quite a problem. Perhaps even a bigger one than you think. I don't think so, Skylar. No? How can you be sure, Gordon, that you won't wind up as the victim? After all, it would be a simple matter for me to, say, poison you, bury you in this cellar. As far as the world is concerned, Gordon DeWitt is dead. No one would come looking for you. I'm also aware of that, Skylar. I shall be on my guard. Yes, Gordon, be on your guard. For I suspect that in a very short time... There's going to be one less DeWitt in this world. There's an old saying that seeing is believing. But more than 120,000 enthusiastic Ford owners say driving is the proof positive. That's why we Ford dealers want you to test drive the 50 Ford before you buy any car. You get the quality feel the moment you slide behind the wheel. A finger's touch brings the great new V8 engine into quiet, eager life. And then as you start your test drive, you'll feel the tremendous power and acceleration at your command. You'll immediately notice the quietness of both the motor and the sound-conditioned lifeguard body. Take out over a rough, tough road and marvel at the way the midship ride floats you across those bumps. Test drive those 35% easier-acting king-size brakes. The lightest touch brings you to a safe, sure stop. Any Ford dealer will arrange a test drive. If you don't know him personally, he's listed in the classified phone book. Call him tomorrow. Before you buy any car at any price, test drive the 50 Ford. It will open your eyes. Now, back to survival of the fittest. Now, Gordon, supper is ready. You don't say. No doubt another one of those indigestible affairs you call supper. <laughs> well, you haven't died yet from one of my meals, Gordon, and you've been here two weeks already. <laughs> Sit down and join me. Bread, beans, and canned pork. Is that all you ever eat? Just about, Gordon. Oh, uh, help yourself. Thanks. After you. Oh, <laughs> of course. 
After all, I did prepare the meal, didn't I? I may be drunk, but not that drunk. Now, Gordon, you mustn't be irritable because you haven't been able to think of a way of killing me and making it look like a natural death. After all, I warned you that I would be a problem. Yes, but I'm no problem. No one knows I'm alive. No one knows I'm here. What are you waiting for? Afraid? Certainly not. It's just that I enjoy the situation. You want to draw this out the last moment, don't you? You think I'll break from the strain of being on constant guard. <laughs> You're wrong, Skylar. I won't. No? Then why have you taken to drink? And look at yourself. You haven't shaved since you set foot in this house. Drunk or sober, I'm a better man than you. <laughs> we shall see, Gordon. We shall see. Uh, more beans. Aren't you afraid you may wait too long, Skylar? I may try to kill you sooner than you believe. I think I shall sense the moment when you finally thought out a plan and decided to act. You will? Look, Skylar. I'm picking up this bread knife. How do you know I'm not going to kill you now? You can't. You haven't thought out a plan yet. You're wrong. I've had a plan from the moment I entered this house two weeks ago. What? Yes, Skylar. As for my drinking, that was an act. An act designed to give you a sense of security and to give me time. What do you mean? I've had time to observe you closely, hear the way you talk, learn your every mannerism. You, you couldn't get away with it. You, you couldn't. Why not, Skylar? Only one person ever sets foot in this house, Dr. Stevens. He sees you rarely, and only for a few minutes. The light is always dim. At best, you're a shadowy figure. He, he'd sense the difference. You'd be caught. No, Skylar. There's a strong resemblance between you and me, and with this beard I'm growing, he'll never know the difference. I, no, you don't. You uh, robbed me uh, of Christine, but you won't get uh, my money. You won't get my money. I'll get it, as I've gotten everything I wanted. No, no, uh, don't... Uh, you stab. Oh. You're dying, Scott. You hear? You've lost. They will ha hang you for this, Gordon. They'll hang you. No, Skylar. But when you die, I'll be Skylar DeWitt. I'll bury you in the cellar, and that will be the end of it all. You'll never get away with it. But I will, Skylar. And I want you to die knowing that. Your millions, Skylar. They'll all be mine. No. You... Uh, uh, uh. Skylar? Poor Skylar. He never had a chance. Yeah. Here, Socrates. Yeah. Get away, Plato. Yeah. You've had enough to eat. As long as you're fed, you don't mind having a new master, do you? Now, you're the only ones who can give me away. But I don't think you will. Hmm. Seems we have a visitor. Now for the impersonation of Skylar. <clears throat> Who's down there? It's Dr. Steven, Skylar. Sounds as though your cold is gone. My cold? Oh, oh yes, yes. Come down let me in. Go away. I don't want to see anyone. Now, don't be unreasonable. You and I have been friends for a long time. Come down and let me in. Not tonight, Doctor. Now, go away. What do we do now, Doc? Let me handle this. You just stay in the car. Who, who's that down there with you? Your lawyer, Paul Adams, and a friend. Well, get off my property, all of you. Skyler, I insist that you let me in. If you don't, I'll force my way in. You'd be breaking the law. That's what you'd be doing, breaking the law. Are you coming down, or do I have to force my way in? I'm coming, Doctor. And you'd better have a good reason for all this. Well, what is the meaning of this, Doctor? Oh, Skyler, I told you I'd be back in a couple of weeks. Well, maybe you did, but that doesn't mean I have to see you. A man can change his mind, you know. Oh, so that's it. You've changed your mind. Well, yes. I'm afraid it's too late for that, Skyler. Well... What, what do you mean? Don't fence with me, Skylar. I thought we'd gone over this already. Well, maybe we did, but I, I don't know. Believe me, Skylar, it's for the best. Uh, have you packed? Packed? I'm not going anywhere. I told you it. It's too late to change your mind. Now let me get a few of your things together. I, I, I'm not going. I, I'm staying here in my home. Skylar, I'm your doctor. I know what's best for you. Don't compel me to use force. Force? Yes. This, this is my house, and if I want to stay here, I'll stay. Now, get out. 
Are you forgetting this, Skyler? What's that? You know very well what it is. These are the papers you signed the last time I was here. Papers? Yes. Committing yourself to an institution. Don't you remember? Institution? You don't remember. Which proves how right I was. First hallucinations. And now loss of memory. Come along, Skylar. No. You can't put me in an institution. I didn't sign those commitment papers. Please, Skylar. I'm not Skylar. I'm Gordon. Gordon DeWitt. Gordon DeWitt. Yes, Skylar's dead. I'm Gordon. I'm not insane. Of course you're not. Now, come along. I tell you, I'm not Skylar. Skylar's dead. He's buried in the... Yes? Nothing. Nothing. I guess you're right, Doctor. I am Skylar DeWitt. I've got to be Skylar DeWitt. I've got to. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? What happened to Gordon DeWitt? Or should I say, Skylar DeWitt? Well, the poor man was taken to a mental institution, and quite depressed he was, too. In the months that followed, he could never quite make up his mind who he was. One moment he would insist he was Gordon DeWitt, then the next moment, suddenly frightened, he would claim he was Skylar DeWitt. Looks as though the poor fellow is a hopeless case, and he's doomed... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. More than 120,000 delighted motorists are already driving the new 50 Ford. Here's what Charles Dahlgren, a contractor, said about his 50 Ford. Well, to make money in my contracting business, I must have equipment that's sufficient and economical. And I get more of both for my 50 Ford than any other car I've ever driven. In my work, I've given my Ford a real beating. And it sure can take it. The big V8 Ford engine gives me power to spare. And our maintenance cost records show that this car is one of the most economical machines we have on the job. We Ford dealers know why owners are raving about their 1950 Fords. Their daily driving has proved that the 50 Ford has everything. But until you get behind the wheel yourself, you can't believe how good it is. Your Ford dealer will be delighted to arrange a test drive. You'll find him listed in the classified section of your phone book. Or perhaps you know him personally. Phone him in the morning. Before you buy any car, at any price, test drive the 50 Ford. It will open your eyes. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, which is played by Maurice Tarplin. In the cast were Everett Sloan, Kermit Murdoch, and Cameron Prudhomme. Original music is composed as played by Al Finelli. This is Derwood Kirby speaking, and this is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>